This week's Kick Aspirational podcast is, features the two co-founders of Hydrant, which is uh, a new uh, hydration product. This one is their uh, raspberry lemonade. It has 100 milligrams of caffeine. They also have, I'm going to mix it up while we're talking. They also have some new, most of their products don't have caffeine in them. But it's the, um, as John Sherwin, one of the co-founders, talks about, uh, you know, this product was designed to mimic your your blood uh, uh, Level. So basically, the, the I think it's the specific density of your blood rather than your sweat, which is uh, where most of the actual, um, it's where it's what most of the research is showing is going to hydrate you the fastest from a state of dehydration. So it's exciting to have these guys on. Uh, they're in their late 20s. Uh, John Sherwin went to Oxford, studied biology, and Jay Kim went to uh, uh, undergrad up in uh, Massachusetts, but then uh, worked for McKinsey for a while. And he's uh, also they're just they're really sharp uh, young guys who uh, we've been lucky enough to invest with as a RX3, but they have a fast growing company that was built almost entirely online, is now going into retail. And in this episode, I thought it was kind of fun to talk to a couple of young guys who, uh, who've done well, who are doing really well. They're growing in uh, their businesses, uh, you know, in seven figures right now and as they say it's going into eight figures this year um, and we get into a little more technical detail on this one a lot of the other podcasts we've had more kind of um, more general descriptions of the work people do and some of the attitudinal and behavioral changes they had to make this one gets kind of technical about how you actually start a company so I hope you appreciate it hope you enjoy it and um, I hope that you try some of this hydrant we have a new uh, kick aspirational uh, code if you want to try hydrant kickass 20 was the code at the end of this you'll hear we discover we decide to use kickass 20 you want 20 percent off hydrant you want to try it yourself you want to stay hydrated drink it first thing in the morning mm. it's absolutely delicious not too sweet and uh, has a great dose of caffeine if you want that and they have it caffeine free if you don't so give it a shot enjoy the ride this is a really fun podcast for people who are into the technical elements of starting a company with uh, John Sherwin and Jay Kim, co-founders of Hydrant. I'm actually just going to start recording. I like to do that on these. Okay. Um, sure. The, Jay, you just asked me if I'm a surfer, and I'm curious why right. you're asking that. Because you got the, the surfer vibe, if you, know, if you know what I mean. What's, a, what's the surfer vibe? Like the, the little bit of chillness and the uh, little bit of sunburn. Yeah. Blonde hair, you know. Still got a little hair left. Yeah, I've got, <laughs> it turns blonde in the ocean. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. And you know what? Um, do you guys do sports? Do we do sports? Uh, yeah. Not anymore, but I, I, I used to. Yeah. What, what sports were you into? Uh, boxing. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Like, what type of boxing? I told you. What type of boxing? It's regular boxing and high Regular school. boxing, just yeah. fisticuffs? Yeah. Oh, cool. Just a what? Yeah, 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 yeah. How long? How long were you boxing? Four or five years. Oh wow. That's yeah. Did you did you compete, or did you were just doing it for fitness? A little bit, a little bit here and there. But I, you know, in order for you to be really competitive in boxing, you have to run a lot. Yeah. For <laughs> endurance, and yeah. I don't really enjoy running, so <laughs> I was selective about um, um, what type of training I can focus on in boxing too. He had the maximum benefit that I wanted. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, going the rounds is the hard work, right? It's yeah, uh, yeah. an endurance sport. Most people, not yeah. everybody knows that. It's amazing. John, do you do any sports? Did you? So did you? I, I did. Yeah. Now I have to say like fitness in general takes the priority, but uh, back in the day I played my share of field hockey, which in the UK growing up was um, a sport both for men and women. I know in the States it's more focused for women. Yeah. Uh, I was going to make a really rude comment, but I won't do that. <laughs> but, hey, it's, it's hardcore. I lost my two front teeth no, uh, mm -hmm. to, to a game of field hockey. Uh, rugby, I never had any major inju injuries, <laughs> but I played that too. So field hockey is a, a sport that should command way more respect than it does in the U.S. No, well, I, I think it was just too aggressive for men, so they only let women play it. <laughs> but, well, no, I mean, well, it was actually, wasn't, wasn't field hockey kind of, was, was that something that was uh, that, like Native Americans played more or less? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. I, I know there's um, a similar a similar sport, but I think in Europe it comes from the Gaelic, uh, I forget the name, hurling. Oh, 
oh, yeah, as yeah, a, yeah. a different sport, which is similar-ish. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were linked. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I don't, I don't have a huge depth of Gaelic history, but I have spent some time in Ireland and uh, and Scotland. Although Scot, the Scots aren't really Gaelic, right? This Gaelic is that, is that reserved for Ireland? Uh, you're putting me on the spot, David. I, I, I have to admit, this is where my knowledge falls short too. I know they speak Gaelic in Ireland now again. And like you see yeah. the signs in Gaelic, which are, might as well be Chinese for me. No offense, Jay. But, uh, yeah, it's, I'm not Chinese. But you're not. <laughs> what you're at this, oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank God this is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> you're this not editing live. this. This might as well be live because I don't edit these. Yeah. So, and I'll say <laughs> I'm Korean. Korean. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I should, I should yeah. see him, of course. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, I should probably introduce you guys. I like to start these. Um, I have a good friend, Pete Holmes, who always starts his podcast sort of, you know, just talking and then eventually he lets people know they're being recorded. But um, you guys are from Hydrant, which is an RX3 investment. I'm on the board of RX3. I like to try and get that out of the way first, just so people know we, we do have a mutual interest. But um, but you have a great story. And uh, I was talking with Nate, Nate Robbie at, uh, at RX3 about you. And then we talked a little bit and... Um, I am holding a stick pack right now of Hydrant nice. Lime, which is, I love these. These are, so tell me, tell us a little bit to get started. Just tell us a little bit about Hydrant. What is it? And uh, how'd you get started with Hydrant? Who's, who, who was there first? Did you guys both start it together? So we, John, John was there first. Yeah, I, the, the brand Hydrant, I was there first. Jay was working on the same problem independently. Uh, and when we joined forces, we kind of uh, brought the the two forces under one roof and that roof that's a great great experimental shot there um and uh yeah so i think the the reason our partnership works so well is jay really brings a uh business experience and lens to everything that we do where i come at it more from a science background with some product experience to kind of solving those problems um with a science lens and I had back in, I think it was back in 2017, I'd started to develop the formula, get a version one of the brand up and running, um, live website. I did go through an Indiegogo. We don't talk about that much. It was a, a long time ago. Uh, and, you know, basically got to the point where there was a very low key version one of everything. And, and it, at that point, it was just a single flavor on the website. Um, at that point, I realized, well, I need to need to raise some money. Don't really know what, what I'm doing. Flavor? Lime. Lime was the OG. Oh, that's, um, that's literally, I didn't know that. And <laughs> I love the lime. I'm, I'm just poured myself the lime hydrant powder in a, how much water do you usually put these in? It's, it's eight to 16 ounces. Okay. So this, but this is a pint. So about 16 yeah. ounces. Yeah. It's, uh, you must feel great right now. Now that you had a sip. <laughs> What's that? You must feel great right now. Now that you had a sip. Uh, <laughs> I do, Jay. Yeah. I do. I now recognize you so happy. That, you're, that you're not from a Chinese origin. You're actually Korean. Now that I've said. <laughs> and <laughs> great that great that you notice. I appreciate it. <laughs> My last name is Kim. <laughs> yeah, that's that should be a dead giveaway. But um, no, sorry, John. So the product tastes delicious. I'm, I love flavor, so I was curious about that. So you you went to Indiegogo and you did a raise on Indiegogo. We did, yeah. Well, I, I use a royal we. Back then, it was just me. So um, we raised about $17,500, which was enough to get our first production run done, uh, at which point kind of flipped the website on once that production run arrived. And that was around the time where I got introduced to Jay. Uh, okay. and, th and this is where the story gets, gets a lot more interesting. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Jay was introduced to me by a mutual friend who uh, I'd worked on. They'd done some marketing for, you know, version one of Hydrant. And they realized that Jay was working on the same problem uh, at that point, uh, about to enter Wharton into the MBA program. So we were introduced, I think it was around August 1st of 2018. Um, and we proceeded to chat about, I mean, long phone calls before we even met in person about our vision for this space of powdered hydration and what these types of products could do. Um, we met, we uh, agreed pretty quickly that uh, a co-founder type relationship was what we were looking at and did some reference checking. And, and honestly, it was around three point, we've been pretty shy about telling the story to date. It was around three and a half to four weeks 
uh, before we shook hands. Why are you keep, keep extending it? It was basically three weeks. I'll give you the raw, <laughs> raw version. I'll just be I, really, I really, really honest here. So you guys met on Grinder, and then you yeah. decided in this. <laughs> Correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. That was, that exactly. was it. Um, so what John doesn't really share in these professional settings is that <clears throat> I actually first cold emailed John. Oh, wow. And then, and then he didn't respond. Ignored it. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't respond to cold emails. Um, Sometimes. It's because I, I it was what was your message, Jay? What was your message? Well, I was like, hey, first. it seems like you're kind of looking for co-founder, and I'm actually working on the same problem. You have this skill set. I have this skill set. I think it makes sense for us to talk. Um, and this guy didn't respond. I'm like, what the fuck? I know you're struggling. <laughs> like, respond to my email. And then I was asking our mutual friend, like, hey. Um, um, are you still close with John? He's, she's like, yeah. Like, you know, I, it seems like he's looking for a partner. He's like, oh, let me just make an introduction. Like, bam, she made an intro, and then he finally replied. Okay. And then we got on a call. He was in the UK at the time, so we were on this like WhatsApp Wi-Fi call. Um, and then he was coming back to New York. I was in Philly. Took the train. I met with John for the first time in person. Right, this was after a week. I sent the cold email <laughs> and we did a walk. <laughs> it was about like 25 minutes into the meeting or 30 minutes. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm ready if you are. And he's like, yo, whoa, whoa, just chill. Like, I just, I just met you for the first time. Like, I, I got to get to know you a little more. I'm just like, come on, man. We're entrepreneurs. Like, why, why are you so for? like, yeah. yeah, what are you waiting for, man? Like, and then, and then we went through an extensive um reference check for the extra two weeks and then we we decided to become a co-founder on after after three weeks and that's basically when i was done with um my orientation at wharton so i sent the email to dean hey i'm done going out what's the process here and i got my money back and then i invested the tuition and the savings that i had for business school uh and hydrant and then that's how we jump started the business oh good for you guys wow that's that's a really interesting start to <clears throat> business so, um, and John, you were living in the UK at the time? I was actually just on a, a vacation back when Jay and I had that call. I, I was always, the, the duration of Hydrant through its various versions has always been based in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Okay. I live in Brooklyn, work in Manhattan. I was going to ask where you are now. So you're in Brooklyn now? Yeah. Oh, nice. And Jay, where do you live? Uh, Manhattan. You live in Manhattan. Wow. Interesting. So, uh, so you started there and then you had how much product did you have at the very beginning you said you had about 17 about 17 k worth yeah about 17 k worth so i think pretty soon after jay joined we did a second production run um and started to to go through this long process of figuring out our own working partnership and like what the next steps <laughs> were, were going to look like that would you know no there's no way of preparing for that i think yeah. um one of the things trial and error yeah <laughs> we, we, and error. <laughs> we are weirdly experts in <laughs> Um, you know, being solo founders who eventually joined forces with someone else, which is yeah. like a bizarre and rare situation yeah. um, and uniquely kind of rewarding in its own way. Yeah, I was going to ask, I was, I was kind of curious if you were living close to, I mean, I guess Brooklyn to Manhattan isn't that far. It's just one bridge away. Um, so you're, you're actually relatively close. Did, uh, so where were you storing the product? Were you putting, like, were you working <laughs> out of like an apartment or a garage? What was happening? So uh, you ask all the right questions, David. <laughs> this this yeah. is the sort of stuff that no one's ever heard. So the first pallet of hydrant ever was delivered to my uncle's house in Connecticut uh, <laughs> on a truck that had one of those uh, lifts on the back, which you pay an extra hundred bucks for, by Lift the way. It. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, they dropped it off in his driveway. At the time, I had this old beater of a wagon. Um, and so I loaded up the wagon, drove it into... Brooklyn and had enough space in my apartment. My roommates hated me to just stack this stuff, uh, yeah. both in my apartment and then also partly in the shared WeWork office that I had, which made me again, super popular as uh, an office mate. Um, so by the time Jay joined, it was kind of still the same situation. We were working off this single production run. The inventory was at the office and at my apartment. And then also in a small fulfillment center up in Syracuse, New York that um, we had a good relationship with. So that was where it was fulfilling from. We weren't taping boxes very early on, kind of realized that is not a good use of, of our time. Um, we, we were focused on trying to grow rather than trying to get good at the fulfillment process itself. 
Well, and let me just add a one comment here because um, one thing that you <laughs> said, probably unintentionally, I think it, there's a like a funny story behind it too. You 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 mentioned that like oh so we're pretty close, but um, actually like uh, choosing um, where the office should be was also uh, like a funny tension between us. <laughs> oh, I bet yeah, because it is <laughs> yeah. Issue, right? yeah. Yeah. I'm like, what about Midtown so that everyone can access like pretty no easily? Way. He's like, no, no way. <laughs> My commute's gonna suck. And he's like, and he's like, how about Brooklyn? It's gonna be so cost effective, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, hell no. So <laughs> we ended up just like sticking with the Tribeca area, which was uh, where the original WeWork was, WeWork was in. Yeah. So downtown. So it's an easy yeah. kind of meet, meet in the middle, more or less. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So Jay, you're you're living in Midtown? Uh yeah, like the uh the Midtown West, like near the end. Okay. <clears throat> we have some friends actually that live in Stuyvesant town that you know in mm. Manhattan that actually open their office in Brooklyn and they just commute on bikes across the bridge. Oh. They live in Spain now, but John yeah, commutes in bike, yeah. I do yeah, city was, bike, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Brooklyn hustler, yeah. So how did you how did you shift? So how how long did it take you to sell through that? How, well, how long did it take, and how did you sell through that first batch that you were uh, storing so wisely in your apartment, we work space, and your three PL? Oh, man, I think Jay. So you you could probably take to talk to that better than I in terms of how long we we placed the product the order for the next, second round of production very soon after. I think if you include the time I had the website up before Jay joined, where the sales were pretty minimal, um, very minimal. Very minimal indeed, yeah. Um, we, we probably were done with that by, by November, I want to say, November or December of 2018. And um, most of that, you know, we, we didn't have experience as Facebook marketers uh, or experience in retail. We were absolutely not yeah. in any way set up to um, kind of just take one channel and run with it. We really had to just figure it out from, from step one. So uh, the initial bump came from Jay's business school friends who knew him for three weeks before he dropped out. <laughs> uh, they generously uh, became our test group and we had a big bump of sales when he first joined. And then from there, it really was just testing through Facebook and Instagram marketing to find the right messaging and the right audience. And just trying to find efficiencies through balancing different messages and audiences. Um, yeah, I'd say that was the main way, Jay, don't you think? I, I, I would say we didn't really catch fire until um, March. Like we start to see some growth starting from January of 2019. But like April was probably the first month when I start to see like 100% or over 100% month over month growth. Um, and it was, I think, mainly driven by number one, our rebranding effort. So a lot of our packaging was really vibrant color, eye popping. So uh, it worked really well in digital acquisition channels for marketing purposes. And that's right, that beautiful package. I'm holding up uh, the packaging now. I'm holding up I, I, the lime, which I just put into a glass. Yeah. And then I've got the two, the lemon and is this cranberry? Res Raspberry, lemon. Raspberry lemon. Raspberry lemonade. lemonade. These ones have, you can tell by the yeah, black yeah. band that they have yeah. caffeine in them. Some have caffeine, some don't, right? That's right, right. right, right. yeah. We have three flavors with We give options. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I think the other yeah, piece, they, Jay, to, yeah. to like the, the catching fire idea that you mentioned is we, you know, typical scientist brain, my thinking in launching with a single flavor, obviously there was yeah, a correct. cost component there, but the other piece was, uh, I thought, why would anyone care about flavor? It's all about function. Very quickly learned in the beverage world, it is not all about function. It is equally, if not more so about flavor. So uh, we quickly rolled out a second flavor, which was grapefruit and having two products versus one suddenly just kind of changed the, the, the dynamic. We really started to feel that forward momentum plus that rebrand that Jay mentioned and the third flavor launch, which was blood orange. Um, so it was really kind of midway through 2019 when we started to feel the, the tailwind. You know, it's, it's funny that, so I built, you know, a company called excess with my partners. Um, it was, primarily based on great taste in energy drinks. We were the mm -hmm. first ones to do flavors, but make them really taste great. Not like cough syrup plus, plus flavor, but just right. great flavors. And, um, and, and different ones, ones that you, know, you wouldn't experience other places. And that's been, you know, that was a big driver. And then people want to rationalize it with the benefits that you get, right? It was kind of this, mm. one of the aha moment for us was that, you know, um, was that people, we think, 
we kind of came to this belief that people make emotional decisions and then they rationalize them rather than make rational decisions. Mm. Like I, I think a lot of CPG marketing is based on this mm. belief that, you know, they're, that somehow consumers are rational actors standing there in an aisle um, with a T chart and a calculator trying to figure out the, uh, you know, some, some decision tree when yeah. in, in reality, most people are, uh, are just, you know, they're making emotional decisions and deciding why it was a good idea. So I, I love the idea of starting with flavors. It's a big one. Your flavors to me, I mean, reminds me of an Indian flavor, uh, salt lime, which is a very popular drink in India. Yeah. Um, and you know, we have a lot of Indian in business and Indian, um, mm. East Indian distributors in the United States who are always asking for a salty salt lime, salt fruit mm. flavor. All your flavors are basically, it's that yeah. it's a hydration product. So you've got salts that you're putting into the water, which yeah. is what right. electrolytes effectively are. Yeah. And, um, and then fruit flavors. Is that right? It's not sweet. <laughs> It, it is sweetened. So there is cane sugar as well, okay. um, but it's a lot less cane sugar than most consumers are used to. So um, we have six or seven grams, depending on the flavor of um, sugar right. yeah. per serving. And uh, if you compare that to, let's say, uh, sort of, yeah, well, a 20 ounce sports drink uh, of the old variety is usually around 34 grams of sugar. <laughs> Loaded um, sugar. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a big difference. The, the other piece really is on the electrolyte side when comparing to those traditional sports drink brands, um, the balance is more like the ratio of electrolytes in your blood than in your sweat. Um, and, th and this balance is something, or the ratio I should say, is based on uh, years, decades of science that has been done into um, re research into oral, oral rehydration solutions. Um, and the WHO, World Health Organization, has a standard for oral rehydration and our science really is based on that same standard and tweaked to taste more palatable and to fit into the kind of daily regimen of you know the the average american yeah no that's something uh byron roth who's uh you know mm. one of the principals at rx3 he he showed this to me i think the first time i saw it was at um at the roth conference in deer valley last winter and he was, he was saying to me, this is the first thing I drink every morning because he said, you know, you think about the stuff you normally drink in the morning, coffee, you know, they're basically, um, they're basically dehydrating you. And this is like a mm -hmm. great way to start the day, especially if like at the Roth conference, you're partying a little bit, maybe uh, <laughs> need, to, need to kill that, that hangover. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. So what are the, um, what are the things that when you're marketing this, what are the key phrases or how are you targeting? I mean, you guys have had, maybe you can walk me through first your growth. Cause I think you've got a great growth story here. Um, or I don't know how much you want to talk about in terms of revenue and growth, but, um, you've I think what we could, yeah, we won't get into like super specifics, but mm -hmm. like what we could share is that I think, you know, we really consider 2019 as our first year. And I think for our 2019, we did low seven figure in revenue and this year we're um targeting to do um somewhere in the uh, eight figure range right yeah. yeah and you're and you're is it okay to talk about this are you profitable so Will what you... we'd like to what we would like to talk about is that uh, <laughs> our retail is very profitable Great. um and amazon is also really profitable so what yeah. we would like to do is that we, we really like to reinvest those um cash flow into acquiring a lot of subscribers to right. really increase our recurring revenue basis. That's fantastic. That's a, that's a great story. And I think that's the reason RX3 came in is um, they usually don't come in as early as you guys are, but right. you're doing right. so well that it was a, it was a compelling story that we couldn't say no right. to. Um, awesome. So tell, tell us a little bit about the, the marketing that you're doing and the messaging that you're using and what's connecting with consumers right now. Why do people pick up packs of hydrant and right now it's hard to even find it in a store right they're not buying it off shelves they're, they're finding you online or via social is that right that's right yeah so our primary acquisition channel and, and jay really runs more of the performance side of this along with our growth team um and i'm more on the sort of brand marketing side so i'll speak to the customers and the messaging and then jay if you want to speak to like the different channels that would probably be the, sure. the yeah. best split so um you know we we early on had all kinds of theories around what the use case is for a product like ours would be. You've already referenced hangovers in general. Definitely a popular one. People love drinking this after drinking alcohol. Um, it's heavily regulated, so you have to be careful how you talk about it as a benefit. Right. What we found was that um, this, this type of use case is very reactive. It's more, uh, I have you know, 
made my body become dehydrated. Now I'm going to drink this to, to become rehydrated. And that's a very occasional use case. It doesn't happen with any regularity. Even the heaviest drinkers, it really isn't that regular. Plus, not necessarily a, 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 an easy category to market around. So we, we figured out pretty early on um, that this proactive hydration message was really uh, what was resonating with consumers and what was going to drive our business forward. So what I mean by that is you, we've already talked about this first, first thing in the morning use case. During the night, you get dehydrated as you sleep. You wake up, you feel fatigued. What is the number one symptom of dehydration? It's fatigue. And yes, you can drink that glass of water and it's going to uh, bring you back to life. You know, you're going to get that coffee as well, I'm sure. Um, but if I can hydrate you faster with a stick of hydrant, you're going to feel so much better in like 15, 20 minutes versus drinking a pint of water. Who, who wouldn't make that trade for a buck, right? It's, it's such a simple message. And, and that started to resonate. And that really was where the flywheel started to kick in. We are talking about the benefit of routinely hydrating yourself before you get dehydrated. It's like a proactive way of going about things. How many of these do you recommend people drink a day? So we say up to four. Um, certainly- So I, this... I, I, I break the rule. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, Jay, how many are you at these days, Jay? Like six to nine. Six to nine a day, wow. Whoa. I used to drink like 12 and John was like, you gotta chill, chill out. Like moderation, bro, moderation. Bro. moderation. Six <laughs> yeah. to nine, those are pretty good numbers. So yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. Four is rookie number. You got to pump that up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that from Wolf of Wall Street? No, <laughs> I don't, but that's awesome. Yeah. I don't remember that now. That's fantastic. So, so Jay, so how are, how are you guys, how are you, how are you guys marketing? So how are you, how are you? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, let me just talk about like channels. So we're um, obviously on our website. We're mm -hmm. um like I said, we are also on Amazon. Um, we are right now in Whole Foods Market in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And we are, um, you know, actually rapidly closing contracts to launch in some of the major retailers this year. Um, so we'll be announcing some in June, July, and September. Um, in terms of marketing, uh, without going to two specifics, like we, we, we definitely explore all kinds of a marketing channel that normal people would expect, such as Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Google, um, influencers, podcasts, newsletter, you name it. What we do uh, personally, from my perspective, that we do differently from other companies is that we are um, extremely quantitative, quant quantitatively driven. So we have a very agile analytical team. Okay. Um, so what we would like to do is we keep, our, uh, we have a very uh, agile process to keep uh, our eyes on, on, on our numbers. So we shift our budget in different channels um, rapidly based on what we're seeing in terms of like positive trends, negative trends um, to make sure that we're hitting our quota on customer acquisition and then, and then the, uh, the revenue we're getting from existing customers. So um, just to kind of recap, like, Although we are operators, we really view ourselves as investors. So we really think about how are we getting the maximum return on invested capital. So we just have, uh, I think, a really good processes in place to keep our eyes on the numbers and make a lot of changes in, in investment and marketing channels. Yeah, I mean, you're thinking like owners, right? I mean, that's the, yeah. it's, that's yeah. like, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're an owner, um, even if it's you, you're raising money, um, you're still thinking about it like, hey, this is mine. This is my baby. Am I spending my money the way that I would spend my money? Because it really is your money. You know? Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. Do yeah, you um, absolutely? So I, I, I like that. That one of the things you're talking about, I think, it's really interesting. Is um, and and I, I actually like to see if you agree with this. You know, it used to be historically, if you go to business school, you work at a CPG company, or a lot of the more strategy-driven businesses. You know, it starts with this grand strategy and then it filters down into these tactics that get executed. And then, you know, you get this, a lot of companies still do this. They have annual operating plans and mm -hmm. they create these strategies and tactics and they go and execute them yeah. for a year and then they come back and, and tell you what happened. Um, it sounds like you're doing something different. And, and I, I'm asking you this because it's something that I think we practice quite a bit with, with Access where 
Um, it's good to, I always think it's good to have a strategy. It's like good to have a plan mm -hmm. when you're starting a business. Everybody needs one. But the thing you find out really quickly, right, is that the people are really what matters because especially in a startup, things change quickly. All the, there's all these un exactly. unintended yeah. consequences, unforeseen circumstances. And, um, and particularly with the social, with social media and, and the internet, speed of change it seems to me now that you know strategy is a good thing to have but it needs to be flexible and dynamic because the tactics will almost totally be strategy do you do you sense that when in the work that you're doing with the with the kind of the live feedback you have through social and, and test marketing? yeah so let me just kind of start on the people comment that you made like yeah. what we truly believe in is regardless of our vision and strategy what matters most is having the right people on the bus yeah and because like once we hire the right people, you don't really need management. The only thing you, you need to manage is the system, right? As right. long as you manage the system and set it clear, then it's self-serve. Um, right. So by, what you mean like clear objectives? Clear objectives and goals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and in terms of um, live feedback, so that totally resonates with us. And I think that's why we are, um, really focused on being data driven so that w as we're getting the live feedback, um, we're revising our strategy and capital allocation plan based on the clear goal that we have set for ourselves quarterly and yearly so that um, we're making adjustment that just fits best in the, in the perspective of the big picture goal. Well, and even, cool. even uh, to add, add on top of that, like even in cases where there's some source of data that requires a period of time for you to collect data in order to make a change, we will also be looking to shorten feedback loops wherever possible. Uh, is there a way, you know, for example, with a subscription, we can change the window so that we're able to start getting results earlier and make changes and react accordingly, just to keep keep everything more agile. So that that also feeds into that whole uh, analytics focused approach that Jay was mentioning. Can Can you drill down on that example a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. So I think it would be um, typically around setting a default subscription window, for example, rather than letting customers choose their own. Um, that there's arguments to be made for both. There's a friction argument against letting people choose a, a subscription window because now they have to think through one more thing other than what flavor do I want and do I want to buy this product? Um, now they're like, oh, how often do I want this product? I don't even know. I've never tried the product before. That's too much. So there's, that's one reason for keeping it simple. The other reason is if we're offering default 30, 60, 90, we're not going to get data back on those 90-day customers for 90 days. We're just not going to know if they're coming back or not. Where on the 30-day customers, at least if they don't like the product or if there's, there's some issue, uh, we're going to find out sooner rather than later and we can start making changes there. And then like, if you were to really accelerate the example further, uh, you could talk about introducing kind of sample, sampler packs with a 10 day repurchase window where you know you send perhaps six sticks. And then this is something we've been testing. It's a fairly common strategy for driving trial online for CPG brands where you have a small unit size and then the re-up window is coming well before 30 days. Again, right. helping you understand like, is this message, this, this product and this market all resonating at once? How did, did both of you guys have backgrounds in consumer, pack, uh, you know, you know uh, CPG and consumer packaged goods or in, in uh, beverages or powders? Not at all. Absolutely not. Actually, to, to, <laughs> sorry, to, to build on that, um, because you talked about people, sorry, it, I'm like yeah. really passionate about the subject. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. good. I can speak for like 12, 12 hours straight. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we actually approach talent very differently from I think a lot of other founders or even what a lot of experienced CPG VCs encourage. A lot of them really focus on recruiting people uh, with like relevant experience, like directly relevant experience or uh, hiring people coming from successful exits like CPG companies. What we really care about is finding um, really smart, hardworking um, people who are curious and who are a problem solver. Um, we care actually less about the direct experience. We have 13 people full time right now and two interns. And of those, I would probably say only one person has directly relevant experience right. that comes from CPG. 
rest of the people don't have any uh, directly relevant experience. And is that because you guys feel like you're doing something so new and different that like experienced people coming with the answers aren't really going to help you as much as people yeah. who are curious and committed to learning? So for sure, like we, we talk a lot about expert mindset versus beginner's mindset. A lot of time when someone, whether you're an investor or a uh, experienced executive, you come in and then you walk in the door thinking that you have all the answer. And when there's a problem, there's always a set solution. What right. we would like to do is let's try to problem solve. Like as a beginner, there's an infinite amount of potential solutions. I don't want to be stuck with, you know, the, the prepare, like the in the box answer. So um, that's really one of the main reasons. Like we, we, we want people to continue to problem solve and innovate. And it's really hard to do that when you, you're already programmed with uh, a, a perception around what is right and wrong. Yeah, you've got too many presets, right? I mean, people are coming yeah. in with a, view, a, a worldview that's probably too fixed to really adjust. And, and, uh, totally. Which is where your opportunity is. I mean, I, I don't think it used to be the big fish eat the small fish. I think now the fast mm-hmm. fish eat any fish, mainly the slow fish. <laughs> yeah. um, size doesn't really matter that much anymore. No, that's, that's savvy. Um, so as you're thinking through this, as you're, as you're hiring, then what are, the, what are the primary criteria? What do you look for? I mean, you said you're looking for people who work hard. How do you, how do you judge that? How do you, when you're meeting somebody or you're sifting through resumes, how do, you, how do you find those people? So we go through a lot of recruiting, like interview process. Um, we have a lot of like interview questions that really probe deep into their character and how they were with response in a certain situation. Um, so I, I, I tend to leverage a lot of those in-depth interview processes to really dig for that specific trait. Um, and when it comes to like practical skill set, we, 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 we craft a very detail-oriented case studies to make sure that they can do what they, what they claim as well. Mm. I think to, to build as well, a- attitude is really something that we're looking for when we hire people. And one of the ways you can kind of sense that just when you get on a call, you get a sense of a person. Uh, or I say get on a call just because right now during this uh, quarantine situation, we've had to do all of our hiring remotely. But um, you, you get a feel for how someone approaches their day to day and their work life. And we really solve for someone who comes in with that curious beginner's mindset and more than anything i've found um, the number of questions someone asks me about the company and kind of how we do things on a day-to-day uh, day-to-day basis is a really good um kind of correlation with how their mindset is going to be once they actually join uh, and it's something you know we, we have not been perfect at hiring from day one uh, we're always learning and getting better at it and i think um it's it's an area we will continue to get better at but as jay said so important to getting this thing right do you guys have a lot of referral it's a good question i would say we 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 have like decent amount of referrals um i'm like super cautious about referrals because i'm ruthless about holding our bar really high and i don't want to hurt anyone's feeling if their friends are rejected um i have rejected a lot of referrals (laughs) so um um so like that's something like we appreciate but if i feel like the person doesn't really have the right background or demonstrate the qualities that we're looking for, then we sort of imply that it's not going to be a good fit. Yeah. So what were you guys doing before this? What was your, I mean, how, well, first of all, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I'm 30. I'm going to be 31 in a couple of weeks. I'm 29. So you guys are roughly the same age. What were you, what was your career paths? What were your career paths prior to, you know, Jana, you were just started <clears throat> business school at Wharton. When this yeah, started, yeah. What were you guys doing before this? So, um, I started my career as a consultant at McKinsey and spend rest of my time in private equity. Um, so kind of the typical boring, like uh, the business school. So so where'd you go to undergrad if you were at McKinsey? Well, I was at GW. Wasn't one of the target schools, but yeah. (laughs) You you figured out how to get into McKinsey from GW? Yeah, it was a lot of cold emailing, networking. That's that's how I cold email John. <laughs> um, so he's good a lot at cold of, emailing. It's true. Yeah, a lot of cold emailing, getting the opportunity, um, um, 
to have someone like take a risk on you so that they like push your resume through so that, you know, I get the chance to demonstrate my qualities. Um, so it was a lot of that. It was a lot of um, getting referrals so that I get an interview with like Bain and then I would leverage that Bain interview, go to BCG and get that interview. And then I would leverage BCG and Bain interview to get interview at McKinsey. So that was literally the, uh, the sequence. Did you ever go to any excess parties at Ibar and GW? No, I did. I, I don't think I really party that much okay. in college. <laughs> we actually had some pretty fairly large excess parties at GW, probably yeah. about about the time you were there. It's funny. <laughs> John, how about you? What was what was your background? So uh, I studied biology at Oxford in the UK. Um, I have a parent, an English parent, and an American parent, so I was born over here in the states, but. Uh, did all my growing up over there. Got the accent, which is really the like secret card over here. And then... <laughs> no one even questions you if you have an English accent and especially a you know an Oxford accent. Yeah, just like, I, uh, I call it my superpower because I get sixty <laughs> seconds extra of anyone's time. Whether it's like the train conductor who you know I, I bought the wrong ticket on Amtrak and they're going to throw me off the train. They're like, oh, okay, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. He's he's got yeah. sixty seconds more to explain how he. Could be a bad up. guy. He's English. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so after college, I, uh, so I studied biology, super into science and kind of, um, also this, this sustainability angle. So not only how can we hack complex systems to make us live healthier lifestyles, but also same idea. How can we treat the planet better? Mm. Uh, and from that, I first was working at a nanotechnology startup also in the UK. Um, it was very small. I was effectively writing patents, which was kind of a, a good experience of the R&D process in general. Um, very quickly realized, you know, if I want to learn incredibly fast about starting businesses, which is really a lot of the role models in my family come from um, an entrepreneurial background. I thought, well, I've got the passport. I should just head straight to Silicon Valley and kind of learn there. Um, so that was pretty much what I did. I, I fired up a few job websites, found a job at a company that made software tools for scientists. So it aligned with my personal mission um, in kind of accelerating the pace of science and was, you know, a foot in the door, if you will, over on the West Coast where I have had no network whatsoever at the time. Um, so over there, I was an early employee, wore lots of hats, some mixture of business development, product management, um, and learned a ton after two years, felt a bit of a plateau coming on and was looking for my next move. And that was when I realized, like, I've been thinking about this hydration thing for forever. And if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? Um, so moved back to New York and kind of got started. And that, that really involved, firstly, a little bit of networking, kind of like Jay on his way into McKinsey. I was finding all the smart people I could uh, in the CPG world just to sort of tell them a little bit about the idea and try and understand like, hey, um, I have this idea for this product. Should it be in powder or liquid? And like, what are the pros and cons? And that was really a, an early decision that had to be made was like, do we make this thing a powdered product or a liquid product? Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, very quickly learned about the uh, pros and cons of distribution in the ready to drink market and how much money you would have to raise to really quickly and successfully launch a business there. Um, as well as looking at uh, the benefits of e-com and the lack of barrier to entry. So powder ended up being an, an obvious decision there. Um, but that's really, yeah, what brought me to, to living in New York and working on Hydrant. Very cool. And Jay, what kind of projects did you work on? I mean, can, can you talk about the types of projects you worked on? Yeah. I can't talk about client names, but I can talk about generally industries. I did a lot of private equity due diligence and I did airlines, auto, um, electronics, cable, like a lot. It was like a mix of a lot of different things. Oh, hospitals, yeah. So like cost saving strategies, stuff like that, yeah. So I understand how John got to powdered hydration drinks, but how did you get from working on projects at McKinsey to powdered hydration? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So it wasn't really anything to do with um, the work itself. I think for me, um, Having to work at McKinsey and private equity, my hours were really long. And I used to live off of energy drink and caffeine. Like, it was a bad cycle from my perspective. Like, every day I would just pour these uh, energy drink 
um, and coffee and um, get that ener boost of energy and then just to get the job done. And then I will get the crash, pour caffeine back in and, you know, get the crash again. I feel like my health is deteriorate, deteriorating and I was really looking for a healthier option to get that energy. And I met a friend who's talking about hacking hydration and I started to look into consuming electrolytes first thing in the morning, every day consistently to keep my hydration level up. And I started to feel a massive difference and I was able to cut a lot of caffeine down um, to feel energized and feel healthy. So I was like, huh, like this is interesting. Um, electrolyte options out there are either really sugary or taste gross. Why can't I make something that tastes great and that's also better for you? Um, so that's how I kind of got into it. Interesting. How did you, and, and how, how did you find John again? You've just found him online? Um, so this mutual friend, um, she runs like this marketing company and then she was referencing Hydrant as one of her, uh, projects that she worked on. And I was like, holy shit, like that's, that's exactly the same thing that I was working on. Um, and I started to look at Hydrant. Like I initially looked at Hydrant as like a company for me to research so that I can develop my product. Tried a product was good. And then I was like, oh, this product's so good. This business must be like way, way ahead of me. And it was literally on LinkedIn as John himself. And he seemed like he was looking for a partner. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, I'm like totally stuck with product development. This guy seems like he only has a product job. I don't have any product job. We should like have a discussion, like how we can potentially partner up and have the synergy. Um, that's how I ended up reaching out to him cold and initially got rejection because he never responded to me. So you thought John looked sad and alone out there on LinkedIn and you reached exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not that I, desperate. I just look. I just yeah. Look I, I don't yeah. know if, if Jay ever saw, but I, uh, on good advice from, I, actually my brother gave me this advice. He, he pointed out that uh, I'm not like a natural born networker and <laughs> he recommended that I open as many channels for other people to reach me as possible. So oh, I really, uh, yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. And, and I, I yeah. actually, I think Jay blew right past these, these elements. But at the time I had on AngelList, a founding team member job roles for ops and marketing. I, I needed more people. I, I needed other bodies to help kind of get this thing to the next level. And Jay just like goes straight through an email, cold emails like, hey, what's up? Let's do this thing. And then within <laughs> a week, say, like, hey, let's be co-founders. Like, whoa, this is a lot. Let's pump the brakes. But you know, obviously we all know how the story turned out. So yeah, uh, yeah. it worked yeah. out pretty well. Yeah. We got the yin and yang type of, uh, type of the partnership. Definitely. Uh, wait, is yin and yang Korean or is that Chinese? I think that's Chinese. Or is it Thai? I don't know. Who cares? You get the meaning. <laughs> oh, I get it. But Jay, what, what's, what's your background with, do, do you have, I mean, how did you know to do the, the marketing pieces? Was that something that you have? You know? Oh, almost everything we've done so far is through trial and error, including okay. making our partnership work. <laughs> like everything was, uh, every, everything required a lot of failures and conflicts. So I think for us, what we really focus on was to let's surround ourselves with really smart people because we don't know shit. Um, we, we, the one thing that we, we did know was we knew what we didn't know. Yeah. So we wanted to find people that can guide us to a direction um, that we can figure things out. Um, so we had a lot of great advisors, great investors, and went through a lot of failure reflection and then try something new again, like that kind of like process. Um, and that kind of got us to get the flywheel going. What are some of the, you know, one of the things I like to ask people is as you're getting started, I mean, it's, it's nice to talk about the successes. It's almost like graduation, like, Hey, we made it, we've gotten to this far and I know you're, you're growing like crazy right now. What are some of the big failures, some of the trials and failures you've had that surprised you or that you've learned the most from? Oh, there's so many. Um, I, I can think John, of my favorite one. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so this was a, a lesson in CPG co-packing uh, and, and kind of packaging sourcing. So we were switching to a higher volume um, producer of packaging. We actually had switched our whole co-packing process from one facility to another. At the same time, we were changing our branding. So we were launching a new brand and changing the materials as well. Um, we did all the things you were supposed to do. We got the samples sent to the office. We tested them. 
we had them send like blank stick packs. We tested them. They felt okay. They looked okay. Um, but somewhere in that process, we must have dropped the ball because what came off the line after, you know, at that point, four months of really hard work, what made us all kind of want to, to weep. It was, it was just, it was so far from the level of quality that we as a brand wanted to, to deliver to our customers. So like the sticks you have there, David, those are, you know, matte finish, high quality. It's like a stiff plastic. It feels good. It looks good. The stuff that we got was crackly like a candy wrapper. And we had just ordered, we placed the biggest purchase order we ever had as a company. And it got to the point where, you know, even, even one investor was just like, oh my gosh, this, this is possibly company killing. That was incorrect. It was obviously not company killing. Yeah, definitely think, not. We got in a fight. It was a very emotional <laughs> response. But the, the, the upshot was we, we had to get scrappy to figure out how do we tell consumers, hey, like this is not normal for us. Normal for us is much better, um, especially when we're launching a new brand. So we actually ended up including... So, so firstly, it, it was a failure. You know, I don't want to spin this completely as a success to not answer your question. It definitely was a failure. But um, to try and make the best of it, we ended up including um, apology note cards in every single order, basically with a discount code saying, hey, look, packaging is fine. Your, your, your product will keep exactly the same, will perform exactly the same. What's inside is no different and it's well protected. But the look and feel of this packaging is not up to, par, not up to, to our par, basically. Um, and so we want to apologize. Here's a discount code, you know, sorry, X, Y, Z um to come back for 25 percent off your next order and i think we we saw a pretty strong retention bump from that and largely it was really well received the fact that we had set people's expectations like hey this this isn't normal for us uh it's just an unfortunate you know production mishap but that was that so was an early yeah. wake up call so there's some other failures too um and i think like i can share advice for others as well as we share this failure. Um, the advice is basically don't, don't try to apply existing playbooks or the things that sound like a silver bullet and just assume, you know, that's going to work exactly the same for you. Um, I think we heard a lot of stories around this crush quote unquote, and this like changed the game for this business. And we tried a bunch of different things with reputable vendors. I don't think I'm going to go into details of the name of the vendor, but um, we've made some serious mistakes thinking that the case study we've heard is also going to apply for us because a lot of advisors, investors are, you know, saying that this worked for them is also going to work for you. Um, and we were really like, this was like early stage. Um, and as a startup, um, time and capital is so precious. So you want to be really cautious about your choices. And you want to be skeptical about everything, right? So that you can be a true problem solver and then thinking about the risk and reward. Um, so we, 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 we have some damages um, with like failed investments early, early days. Um, yeah. Like what sorts of failed investments? What do you mean? Like marketing projects. Such as? I, I, I won't go into uh, detail because people could find out. Um, but let's just talk about I think like, you can talk in general yeah. terms, Jay, about, about like, a, so, right. um, I, yeah, I, I can tell the story. Um, what, well, what I don't know which one you're thinking. Like, well, yeah, there, multiple, there have been yeah. a few. I, I'm going to talk about like a big, a lot, probably our largest failed investment as a brand was in a large creative asset. So we, we had seen, um, some of these kind of big success stories, for an e-commerce company specifically where they launched with a, a really big bang with a video that was just like off the charts viral. And so we wanted to recreate that. And, you know, we were new to it. We didn't really understand the dynamics of what actually goes into the creation of a viral video. Most of the viral videos you see online today have not actually gone viral. Well, if it's from a company, they haven't gone viral. There's a lot of money being spent behind the video to push it to a broader audience. You don't necessarily see that when you look at the video, you'll see, you know, 10 million views, um, maybe 9 million of those are paid for. Uh, and, and it's just impossible to know. So I think we went in perhaps with uh, less 
knowledge than we should have. Um, and the landscape around how those types of long form video assets perform had changed within the past six months. We didn't know that. So we invested in a longer form video asset when Facebook was starting to optimize for short form video assets, mm. which kind of caught us in the situation where we had a really high quality, high production value video and not a lot we could do with it really. So we did end up using it, but in, from an ROI standpoint, you know, it was not a big win and, and definitely, um, yeah, I wouldn't say we wouldn't do it if we went back in time. I think we learned a lot and it, it made us learn what we didn't know as well. Um, but certainly we could have allocated those funds uh, more efficiently with 2020 hindsight. That's, that's, that's wise. I, I'm uh, spending a fair bit of time with Tim Staples from shareability right now. Who's got a really interesting, I don't know if you know their business, but they've, they've put about 26 videos on YouTube's homepage through oh, cool. basically creating viral, viral videos. He just did a podcast with Aubrey Marcus. That was excellent, but he has a book out called break through the noise. That's, oh, yeah. that's excellent on some of that. And, um, to your point, um, part of it is the quality of the video. Part of it is how you structure it. So it hits the algorithms and people see it on a feed and actually want to click right. on it. And part of it is getting to the top of that feed one way or another. And generally that requires amplification, which requires cash. Right. Um, so yeah, there's a, it's a combination punch really. And it's, uh, it's not, it's not easy. It's not getting easier. <laughs> there's no silver bullets. That's like uh, the big lesson. <laughs> there's definitely no silver bullet. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really interesting. So as you're, as you're now uh, approaching, let's just say you're, you're approaching eight figures, you're growing, you're expanding into traditional retail. What's the vision for the business? Where do you want to be in a year, three years? What comes next? I'll take a, take a stab, Jay, and you want to jump in, fill in the gaps. Um, so I think for us, the, the next step really beyond, beyond the retail expansion is broadening the product portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, we talked already about the importance of flavor and how, the experience of the product is such a, a key piece. So first and foremost, we need variety in flavors. When you sell a product on a subscription that people are taking one to four times a day, sometimes more like in Jay's case, you, you, you want there to be enough variety in flavor for them to really um, not get fatigued on a single flavor. And, and that was something we learned really early on when we only have one, two flavors. People were starting to say, you know, like I'm just, I'm just not feeling it anymore. I, I need something different to, to change it up. So that's first and foremost on the roadmap, new product flavors. Secondly, it's taking our customer insights and rolling those into new product development. That's new functions. Um, so to speak a little bit about that product development process, um, first we speak to customers, listen to them, analyze the data and understand like what do people really want? What are the problems that we're solving for them? Uh, hydration. A quick vehicle. question: How are you talking to the customers? How are you How are you reaching them? Every way that we can. So we have uh, email, chat, phone, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Like we we leave as many channels open as possible, and are listening and responding through all of those channels. The customer from day one was really made kind of like the the centerpiece of our business, and you know our our, our base formula for our core hydration SKU has been updated three times now. Uh, no. twice actually it's on version three um just through that feedback you know not dissolving quick enough was a problem with version one and it was a little too salty uh and then immediately the benefit of making that change from listening to that feedback was was huge um another reason for people to launch faster rather than waiting for perfection um so we we listen in that way we also have invested actually in some um ethnographies so this is where you take a uh, team of researchers and actually go to the house of the customer and interview them over a period of three hours to really understand like what drives this consumer? Like what are the other products in their, you know, in their kitchen, in their medicine cabinet? Like what are the things that get them through their day? What builds their routine? And that word routine is something that's going to keep coming up. We, we, we learned that um, really the role hydrant plays it's not really like a supplement, which is quite a transactional relationship. It's something where you, you know, you take it once and done. You're not really present through the experience. Although we have a benefit package, which feels a little bit like a supplement because of the experience factor, we're delivering a lot more. And people were treating hydrant as this like intentional moment in their day to do something for themselves, for their health. 
And that's what we're really leaning into with this new product development. So are you going into broader functions? Is it still going to be hydration or, or can you talk about it? Yeah. So, um, hydration, oh, wait, I'm mixing a second one right now. This one has hundred no. milligrams of caffeine in it, two hundred milligrams of LPN. Today, but I'm going to have at least two. <laughs> don't, don't forget the L-theanine, David. That's, uh, that's the key. For what? Out the caffeine. Uh, L-theanine is an amino acid found in green tea. Uh, well, found in all tea, um, that when combined with caffeine can, uh, reduce the jitteriness, mm. uh, remove the crash and kind of, it, it builds on the alertness you get from caffeine. Less buzz, more focus. Uh, um, can I snort it or do I need to drink it? <laughs> I have never done that research. So, I mean, that's a, that's really? a great segue to okay. talk about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it offline. <laughs> great segue though to, uh, to what kind of research we do do to launch a new product. So we, I'm linked still to the scientific community in Oxford and uh, we really leverage them to help us research individual ingredients for efficacy before we include anything new in the lineup. So the process is usually, what are the functions our customers are asking for? Uh, what are the functions where we see opportunity in the market? Is it, are we serving existing customers? Are we creating a new category to bring new customers into our kind of brand world? Um, always built with hydration as the, the core benefit and then building on top of that. So. Once we have that, we'll then look at what the main sort of top 10 ingredients for that function are on the market, and we'll do a deep literature dive. So we build our own database of all of the academic literature, sometimes spanning back you know, as much as 30, 40 years, um, so that we know, okay, in the case of L-theanine, 200 milligrams is the effective dose uh, when mixed with caffeine. And this is an effective enough ingredient for us to put in. Customers are gonna feel the difference versus if we did not add that into the product. And on the flip side, I'm getting pretty long-winded here, so. <laughs> no, no, this is good. Actually, I'm a little bit of a nerd on this stuff and a lot of people who um, follow me are you know, pretty interested in what we do with excess going from energy drinks into sports nutrition. So I think right. it fits with that same strategy. So, so I, I mean, the, the flip side of what should you include is, is what shouldn't you include. And I. I from day one, our product philosophy has always been very minimalist. It's like only include those ingredients that serve a purpose, whether that's an experience purpose or a function purpose. Um, and so, you know, it's just as important to look at what ingredients, if, if we take a category, and again, I'm trying, I'm going to great lengths to not reveal the upcoming product launches here, but let's take an existing category. Dave's already said it's snortable caffeine. <laughs> and look at Wall Street the, stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he loves Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> um, <laughs> the opening scene. No, no yeah. excluded. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you if you look at the sort of the incumbent brands in some of those areas um, of supplements, they will have you know the same five top ingredients in their, in their formulas that are doing most of the heavy lifting, supposedly. If you do a deep dive into their formulations, uh, sorry, into the ingredients specifically that they use, often you'll see actually the research behind the given ingredient is 20 years old and the more recent research shows that it, it does nothing at all. It's right. just a waste of everyone's time and space. And so we'll pull that out. No questions asked. If, even, even if like it's trendy to put it there, if the data is not there, no, no place for it in hydrant. So... That's great. No, I mean, we had that with, um, when we went and started looking at BC, you know, branch chain amino acids, BCAAs, mm -hmm. there's, you know, in sports nutrition in general, there's a lot of light research with heavy marketing. Yeah. And, um, the, uh, you know, the, I mean, the ship had sailed on BCAAs and one, it's not clear that just adding BCAAs on their own does anything. You know, the research behind it was really light, but two, um, if you add too many, it probably blocks protein synthesis, which is what people are trying to do anyways, because it, you know, basically your RDA chain takes protein, converts it into lean muscle mass. And it's, it's like, it's like a combination lock. You have the right, have to have the right amino acids at the right time in the right order. And if you overload it, you could block the chain, you could clog it. There's a lot of different things that can mm. probably happen, but um, you know, breaking through that noise is tough uh, because when people walk into a retail vitamin shop or GNC or whatever it is, a lot of them have an idea of what they want based on who knows what, you know, reading a fitness magazine or something, which may have had a, you know, 200 word article about the thing that they think they, they know something about. And um, I think to your point, you know, when you can actually create a product 
that has a notable difference. And when people try it, the experience is like, wow, that, that was different. That's, uh, you know, it solves some big problems for me. It, um, maybe it's not as jittery. Maybe it gives me more energy, more power, more focus, whatever it is, but I don't feel like I'm doing lines of blow at the club. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think, you know, actually you start to get these Eureka consumer responses. Right. And you start to say, wow, this, and they, that, then they start talking about it. And that's when you get a lot of, a lot of legs on a, on a product and it becomes a lot of fun. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Jay, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would probably add just two things. Like one is, um, in terms of people, once again, going back to people, uh, we, we, we believe that, you know, in the next two, three years, we'll be one of those companies that other companies want to recruit from. And we really want to hold that high bar and make sure that we're hiring the best people that we can, um, who are problem solvers, that's gonna, you know, get our business to the next level. So there's that uh, a vision around talent. And um, the second component is that in any of the channels that we're in, um, we, we want to demonstrate to our investors and um, to the market that um, we're the winners in, in, in each of the channels that we're in. So when it actually comes to uh, a retail strategy, um, a lot of times there are, uh, a lot of the investors will push for um, existing playbooks that has worked, you know, 10 years ago on brand X, you know, five years ago uh, uh, with the brand Y. Um, what we would like to really do is think about um, on any of the retail accounts that we want to launch, what is our probability of win here? And what, it would, what would it take us to be the winner in here? And really think about like um, making sure that any account we go in, we're the winner. So that like, yes, retail strategy overall is a war, but we're picking the right battles so that we're winning all the battles so that we're, we can also uh, win the war. Um, and same goes with, with Amazon, whether you are searching for, you know, uh, you know, XYZ keyword or, you know, ABC keyword to kind of find electrolyte products, making sure that we're a winner there. And, and on our website, it's, you know, constantly growing the subscriber base, like, uh, you know, leveraging John's scientific background, kind of connecting that science with um, enjoyable experience so that we are uh, creating a massive subscriber base so that uh, customers are continuing to come back and, and incorporating hydrant uh, on a daily basis. That's excellent. And you, you obviously taken and you know, you've, you've raised money, you've, you've started it yourselves, you raised money. Um, most investors at some point want an exit. What's your strategy? Are you thinking about um, building this to own it for a long time? You think about building this to sell it? Are you, you want to be the biggest in hydration? What's, what's the, what's success? Yeah. I, you know, that's a really good question. A lot of people ask, ask us that. I think but what we're really focused on right now is, like, you know, exit is not, not, not something that we're currently focusing on. Like, what we are focusing on is um, executing the vision that we describe, and, and we believe rest will follow. Whether that means, you know, we're owning it for a long time, big, becoming the biggest hydration business, or going to public, or, um, you know, selling it to, you know, a great player, whatever, whatever it, it will be we believe it will follow as, as long as we focus on executing the vision. I think that's smart. We, um, you know, we had, I'm, I'm a big fan of disruptive behavior largely because, you know, I, I, I like to say, look, I wasn't chosen by the right school or the right team or the right profession. I did kind of choose myself and build something. And the, you know, the, the nature of that is you're going to have to be disruptive because you're going to have to break through somehow. Right. There's no way, unless you're the 800 pound gorilla, there's no way you're going to go head to head. You're going to find flanking strategies and other ways. Exactly. To, Make yeah. work and the kind of the beauty of that is when you do figure out disruptive successful strategies and, and you get good at doing that year after year after year um eventually the right opportunity does come i was at a bevnet conference and the one of the publishers of bevnet who i'm not terribly fond of was um kind of chastising me in a panel in front of everybody saying well you'll never be able to sell because you only have one customer and i said well you know i don't think you know that and what he didn't know is we were actually in negotiations to sell it to our biggest customer. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> and we had an excellent exit. We had to do an earn out because it was one customer, but we maxed all our KPIs. It was, it was really successful. It was good for them, good for us. And, you know, somebody asked me, one of our distributors who I love dearly asked me, you know, are you bummed that you sold it? You don't own it anymore. You know, you, you sold it, you had to work for the company. And I said, no, you know, it was the, the funny thing about it is when we actually negotiated that sale, it was, exactly the right thing for us. It was exactly the right thing for our customer. 
we were kind of at a loggerheads in, in some ways about what we could do next because of the, how fast we were growing in our size and they needed to buy us strategically and it was, it was good for everybody. But, um, but I never, you know, you, those are the things that I think where, where I think people go wrong a lot of times is where they're like, they get hung up on, I want to go public because I want to have an IPO next to my name or I want to ring the mm -hmm. bell at NASDAQ or whatever the, you know, the trophy is that they're trying to accomplish right. rather than right. you know a, a real real end state that actually makes sense and works for everybody and i think it's wise to just let that happen organically and find the best partners because those especially these days tend to be the best ones anyways that's totally that's smart so um so cool so what's uh can you tell me what the next flavor is Ooh, i don't know how secret are the next flavors jay <laughs> <laughs> well what is this being announced well, this podcast? <laughs> uh, this will probably go out in a week or two. Um, do you want to give like one, one, one flavor sneak peek? Come on, Dave is a bro. Dave is a friend. <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go surfing with him. Let's I, chill, bro. Okay, one, you're <laughs> definitely invited. Come out to California. I'll take you surfing. <laughs> uh, you're welcome to stay with us. We've got plenty of boards and wetsuits. And uh, nice. just in fact, I just took an Italian friend surfing today. Our beach has just reopened here in Laguna. But... But two, I'm asking that question because we had a lot of flavors at Excess and we would literally be launching a new flavor and I'd have like distributors just begging me. They'd be like, oh, this is really good. So what's the next flavor? I'm like, dude, we just gave you a new flavor. Like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> so it's kind of, kind of tongue in cheek on that. You don't have to answer. Yeah. So, so I, won't name, I won't name the flavor, but I'll say we're, we're bringing in some tropical influences uh, on uh, some of our upcoming flavors um, where you know, we've stayed citrusy so far because citrus fruits go really well with the saltiness of electrolytes. Like you mentioned the salt lime flavor yeah. in India. Um, and while that's been a strength, a lot of people are just saying, Hey, you know, give us something different. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to deliver on that and uh, keep those customers happy. I have no idea what your next flavor is, but you know, if you go to Mexico, you get mango on a stick with salt on it. So I'm just, just throwing out oh, an idea. Good you to know. know. Uh, Who knows? I'm, I'm not going to give anything okay. away here. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not baiting you there. I'm not baiting you there. Um, well, that's exciting. And, and you're, you're primarily sold in the United States right now. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Only sold in the United States right now. Any plans for international expansion? You know, it, it's come up. It's definitely crossed our minds. I think uh, the obvious one to consider, well, the obvious ones to consider would be Canada and Mexico, just given geographical um, proximity. It is operationally challenging. Uh, maybe the, maybe we can uh, figure something out, you know? <laughs> the, Leverage uh, your success there. Yeah, no, we, I mean, I think right now with New Age, you know, we're- Putting you on the spot here. <laughs> We're expanding like crazy. We're looking for good partnerships. Yeah. Two of our biggest markets yeah. are in Asia. So there's always opportunities yeah. in yeah. hydration. We would love to expand like crazy as well. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's expand like crazy. That's always a good way to do it. Although I'm not in Spain. Let's um, be crazy. Change the world. <laughs> <laughs> good thing. No, that's awesome. No, I, I think you're right. It, look, every time you're uh, launching a new market, you tend to have to reformulate. There's, it's like launching a new business almost. And so partnership matters and doing it right matters. And Having a good plan is a good idea, but um, I was just curious if you were, if you were heading anywhere new. Uh, David, do, yeah. do you mind giving us a little bit of background on yourself? Like, I, I know you're really successful, but I became more curious uh, when you share that you didn't go to right school, blah, blah, blah. So we'd love to just kind of get, uh, get the 30 second gist of it. Yeah, I mean, the short story is I, uh, I got kicked out of a conservative Christian college, um, Wheaton College, for my poetry by mm. the end of my third year. I was studying philosophy huh. and, and political science. So, you know, uh, when, I did, when I did graduate a year later, yeah. nobody was hiring philosophers. It happened to be a big recession, 1991. Mm. I don't think you guys were born yet. And um, actually, I was 1989. 99. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Yeah. 19, yeah, so. We'll do the math on that. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Jay, what was your mom's name? I'm sorry? No. <laughs> so, what, what, <laughs> oh, what was my last name? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so... A terrible question. But oh, no, so the, uh, I actually went and worked in Japan after college and uh, was an, an oh, editor for konnichiwa. biotech, high tech, and konnichiwa. <laughs> yeah. here in, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> in California. But no, so the, um, you know, I basically had to just find opportunities and create mm. great opportunities and take risks and uh, ended up being very entrepreneurial for, through most of my career. Mm. I, I worked in the beverage uh, alcohol industry. I ran a beverage alcohol laboratory. Started out doing marketing, ran the front office uh, up in the Napa mm. Valley and uh, ended up in tech, started the large.com, 
um, with, with some partners. Uh, we ended up buying a Red Bull distributorship. I was in charge of sales and marketing. We were oh. doing internet plumbing, managing kind of internet data centers. And uh, nobody wanted to come talk to us at Comdex. So we built a two-story mm. trade show booth. And uh, that Love time it. plasma screens were hot. And we had plasma everywhere, you had plasma <laughs> runway. And we had a Red Bull bar at the center of it. And um, one of the things we noticed giving a lot of Red Bull away was that, uh, you know, the reason that I bought a Red Bull distributorship is I said, look, if you're, if you're at a Comdex trade show in Vegas, by day two, what does everybody need? You know, they need energy and they need, need to kill a hangover. They and need so, hydrogen. That's what they, they need. They, they do need <laughs> hydrogen. We weren't, we weren't that advanced back then. We yeah, were just, yeah. uh, we were doing very short term measures. But, uh, but Red Bull was brand new. A lot of people loved it. They came to our booth and they allowed us to sift through the people to talk to them about our business. And um, so that was, that was a really big insight for me. Mm. Um, dot coms melted down the the data centers we were in went out of business around 2000 i took a job as a cto in seattle uh i was looking for the next thing to do and found a nutrition company that was in a lot of trouble they were doing low glycemic sports nutrition which is like low sugar sports nutrition around 2000 2001 hmm. so i started consulting oh. for them and helping them fix some of their e-commerce and um in the process I was looking at their product portfolio and said look you're doing no offense guys they were doing powders and bars and I was like, powders and bars are cool, but that's a pretty busy space. Yeah. And you're not doing anything that unique. Um, you know, why don't you do an energy drink that solves these key customer experience problems? You know, don't like the way it tastes, too much sugar, makes me feel guilty drinking it, terrible crash at the end. And so we kind of came up with a much better experience, tasted great, no sugar, and gave you all, like 5,000% of the USRDA of B12 that gave you this long long glide path rather than the, the rocket ship ride. Mm. And, um, and that was, you know, that became the foundation for, for a lot of our success. And fortunately, you know, uh, well, unfortunately, diabetes and obesity became, you know, the two biggest causes of preventable disease and death in, in America. And then we exported that to the rest of the world. And so no sugar, low sugar became, you know, a mantra for a lot of folks. And it was, uh, it was good timing for us. And Ultimately, I think the biggest thing, key for our success is we found an alternate distribution channel. So we weren't trying to break through the noise on shelves or having to spend a lot of money that we didn't have to get into distribution that wasn't going to help us. And uh, I think to, to your credit, very similarly, um, you know, we found an earlier channel. Uh, we went into direct selling, and um, which was very strange and different. People told us you couldn't sell drinks there, but we did. Um, and we did it very differently. And... Uh, and that led to a lot of different things. You know, it led us into a lot of different uh, partnerships and relationships and, and opportunities. And, and eventually it led me to uh, meeting Aaron Rodgers through my friend Rob Bell and then uh, Byron Roth and Nate Robbie and uh, it brought me into RX3 as I was kind of leaving my partnership with XS and Amway. And, uh, and then those guys introduced me to, Byron introduced me to Brent Willis at, at New Age. And, um, I really felt like New Age was doing kind of what I had wanted to do at Amway, but we just kept, it's, Amway's a large conservative company. They're a great business, but um, they're not interested in moving as fast sometimes as I would like to or taking the risks that I would like to. And that's, that's their, and they, they, sh and they, they probably shouldn't. Um, but I was, I kept, we kept getting pulled into like, you know, early social commerce, uh, into e-commerce. We got, kept getting pulled into partnerships and retail where Amway tip, traditionally didn't do business. Um, and, uh, and I had to fight my way into those things. And so when Brent was showing me this omnichannel model where it was all about, you know, he was thinking more about DTC and retail. And I was pointing out that you're kind of missing, uh, direct mm -hmm. selling. And then they bought Marimba yeah. and, you know, anyways, so they built out a platform that we are refining and improving, but, um, but that model, you know, where you're really building it from authentic consumer demand via DTC and direct selling, and then getting pulled into the right retail partnerships, uh, that made a lot of sense to me rather than trying to raise a ton of money to push yourself into retail when in my opinion, you know, traditional retail in general is sort of broken and uh, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means you got to be really careful where you, where you go and who you partner with. And I think part of the reason that uh, RX3 likes what you're doing with hydrant so much is you seem to be doing that very, very well. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think your story resonates a lot with us, <clears throat> especially around um, the risk taking appetite and, kind of blocking the noise around what you should be doing and then you thinking about independently what's best for yourself. Um, yeah. I think that resonates a lot for us. Yeah.
Yeah, and, and also being comfortable with people who don't want to take those risks. I mean, when I was younger, it was really frustrating for me. And, and I got burned pretty badly a couple of times. I mean, I definitely yeah. changed my risk tolerance over the years. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it's, it's good to learn how to, how to work with other people that maybe aren't at the same place you are uh, for good right. and, and then figure out how to do the best you can. Um, this has been really fun. So how do people find Hydrant if they want to buy it right now? What's your, what's your website or what's your, what's your social media pages? Yeah, yeah, so go ahead. go ahead, John. No, no, use your British accent. Let's let's charm them. <laughs> my best, my best, mar my best marketing version. We are at Drink Hydrant on Instagram and Twitter, uh, and on Facebook. I guess we're just search for Drink Hydrant. And drinkhydrant.com is the best place to get Hydrant. Whether you want it one off or subscription, we'll take care of you. Uh, the, that's the best place to find us. But we're also available, yeah. as we said, on Amazon and in Whole Foods in the Northeast. That's awesome. Do you guys have any special codes for kick aspirational kick aspiration? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. John, what should the code be? Kick or ass or kick ass? I mean, or I'm oh, what should it be? Kick or surfer. You could, you could do. So in the past people, the life is good. Like the kick aspirational and then a number, whatever the, the, yeah. Is it too long? Kick us. In, yeah. It might, be a little, it might be a little long. Yeah. How about, how about kick ass 20? Kick ass 20. I yeah. like that. Kick ass so, 20. Yeah. Kick-ass, no space, two zero, just so that everyone's totally Kick-ass, two zero, kick-ass 20. Is it kick-ass 20 motherfucker or is it just kick-ass 20? Mm. There's just no room kick to Kick-ass 20 that mofo. That's, yeah. <laughs> kick-ass 20. <laughs> kick-ass 20. That's awesome. I love it. Thank you. On behalf of all the kick aspirational listeners, thank you for kick-ass 20. I'm encouraging everyone to use Hydrant like I do. It is a great way to start your mornings and is a great way to stay hydrated throughout the day. And, uh, and with the hundred mils, hundred milligrams of caffeine, you can actually get a nice little lift out of it too. And John, I listened L theanine, the amino acid that, uh, focuses your attention around that caffeine. Is, am I getting that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a little wonder. <laughs> So and David, I heard, uh, <laughs> I <know>. uh, <laughs> I, and I heard you're going to uh, post about a hydrant on your Instagram page. Is that right? <laughs> this will all go on my Instagram page. I will post on hydrant on my Instagram page and uh, nice, nice. we'll have some fun with it. I appreciate yeah, awesome. it. You can just swipe up, drink hydrant. Swipe up, <laughs> swipe up, drink hydrant. Yeah. I love it. Well, yeah. love thank it. you for having us, David. It's been, it's been good chatting and also learning a little bit more about your kind of risk taking journey to where you're at now. Yeah, thanks. Thank I, you for I, taking a risk on us. No, for <laughs> sure. I'm really excited about where you guys are headed and uh, very, very proud of our association through RX3. And I hope we actually get to start distributing you with, uh, with New Age. I know we've uh, started some yeah. conversations there. So yeah. I, I hope we can pick you up. It'll be fun. Let's do it. All right. Very thanks, cool. fellas. Really appreciate your time today. This Thank is you. The, this has been the Kick Aspirational Podcast. It's not a spectator sport. And uh, please reach out to Jay and John at Drink Hydrant. If you have any questions about what they're doing, their journey, and uh, their phenomenal products that you should definitely be drinking. Thanks a ton.